So you decided to take up photography. You've taken a few pictures and now you want to edit them. You fire up Lightroom for the first time. The window opens and you begin to sweat as you stare at the beast in front of you known as Lightroom Classic and wonder, where do I even begin? Well, that's what I'm gonna help you with today. I'm gonna to hold your hand from importing the photos into Lightroom to exporting the final product to post to Instagram and show off your new skills. I'll even show you a few more advanced features along the way to help your editing go even smoother. So first off, you wanna open up Lightroom. And if it's your first time opening it, it's going to want you to create a catalog, which is what's going to house all your photos and edits. Some photographers choose to create multiple different catalogs. For example, one for client work and one for personal. That way they always stay separate and they don't get mixed up and you can always find a specific photo or album if need be. Or create a new catalog for every event. If you're a hobbyist or beginner photographer, one catalog should suffice for now. One sec. Gotta get that coffee. So you should get a pop-up where you can click create new catalog. Then you wanna make sure you're creating a new folder on the fastest storage device on your computer. For me, that is my main SSD within my documents folder. So create a new folder to house all your edits and backups and your new catalog. For me, I'm just going to make this a tutorial folder for this video, name it and then click create. Now you need to create your catalog and save it within that folder. So same thing, just going to, oh, can't spell. Just going to create a tutorial catalog for this video and click create. And that'll save it within that folder. Once you do this, it'll launch into the main window. Now we're officially in and ready to start adding photos. First thing is to make sure you look at the top right hand corner and make sure you have the library tab selected. Once you have that tab selected, you'll see some of the features change on screen because this tab is mainly for adding photos and culling through them. For the new photographers or hobbyists, culling just simply means to sort through your photos from a shoot and choose the best ones that are gonna be edited and sent to the client. Next, we wanna head over to the left-hand side and see where it says collections. Click the little plus symbol and click create collection set. This is gonna allow you to create one giant category or folder to house subfolders called collections. I personally will create collection sets based on my shoot, like landscapes or portraits, and then add my specific landscape location and date or portrait shoot inside a subfolder inside that collection set. So create one of those and name it for whatever category your shoot falls under or however you wanna organize yourself. For me, my shoot took place at Apps Mills where I'm gonna be adding the photos from and then click create. Now that that's done, plug in your SD card and it should automatically open up the import window where you can select your SD card, folder, and then the specific photos you want to import. For me, mine's on my hard drive already, so I'm going to click import and it's on my desktop, so I'm gonna select the folder from the shoot and I'm just going to select a few photos from here just for the example in this video. My apologies, some of these probably aren't that great, so. So select your photos and then before you click import, it's important to head over to the top right hand side and see where it says add to collection. We're gonna check that box and then there's a little plus symbol that'll come up. We're gonna click that and then it should say name the collection, but we first want to check inside a collection set so that we can add it to the collection set or category that we already just created prior to this, and then name it for whatever date and location your shoot is from. Mine was from a nature conservatory called Apps Mill, so I'm just gonna name it that inside that collection set for the sake of this video and uh, expediency. Then click create. So now we've created that collection that's gonna go import those photos inside the collection, inside the collection set. It's folder inception. <laughs> Finally, click import. Once the import is finished, all your photos are gonna be laid out in a grid. You can change this by either double clicking on a photo or by clicking E to go to a larger single shot view. I definitely didn't choose my best shots from this here. Sorry, it was a big folder, so I just chose a few random ones for the video. Don't judge me too hard, okay? Now you can scroll through picking the winners and discarding the losers. That sounds very dark describing it that way. You can do this by using your left and right arrow keys on your keyboard. And here's a little advanced tip for you to help it go way quicker. Press the X key on the photos that you wish to discard and the P key on the ones that you want to pick. I'm not sure between those two, so I'm gonna pick them both and I'll choose after. There we go. And we'll get rid of this one over here, pressing X. So this just marks them as either rejected or picked. Once you've sorted through your photos and rejected and picked the ones that you want, using the X and P method, we'll go up to the photo in the toolbar and go down to delete rejected photos. 
Now it'll select the rejected ones and you can choose to either just remove them from Lightroom or delete them from your disk entirely. So that way they don't take up extra space in your hard drive when you don't need them to. For me, I'm just gonna remove them from Lightroom for now. Now you're left with only the ones that you picked and the ones that you're gonna be editing and sending to your client. Now the fun begins, but first more coffee. So now let's head to the develop tab. Again, up in the top right corner from library, click and make sure develop is highlighted. This will open up a lot more options and this is, as they say, where the magic takes place. I don't know who they are or if they actually say that, but it's what I say, so. In here, you'll see a preview window on the left-hand side and your histogram on the right-hand side. I purposely underexposed this shot so that I could retain some of the highlight detail because I wasn't using an ND filter, um, but that's why a lot of my histogram is kind of pushed towards the underexposed side or the shadow side. So we're mainly gonna be paying attention to the features on the right-hand side in this video. I'm mainly gonna be covering the basics in this video, so I won't be going into every feature. So feel free to let me know in the comments below if you want another video detailing more advanced options and features for more extensive editing. Right below the histogram is five editing tools that open their own panel of controls and options. These are the edit panel, which is where we'll be spending most of this video, the crop overlay tool, the healing brush, red eye tool, and the masking tool make sure that the edit tab is selected. The first thing we're gonna be addressing is white balance. If you didn't set your white balancing camera before taking the shot, there's a chance that your camera's interpretation of what should be white in the image may be off. This can sometimes happen even if you're using auto white balance, though modern auto white balance is usually pretty good. So this is where we're gonna edit the white balance and you can do that manually by moving the temperature slider and the tint slider and just do that until you find what looks best to you. You can kind of see what happens when I move these sliders back and forth but it looks pretty good to my eye, so I'm gonna keep it as was shot. Lightroom also makes it easier by including this little eyedropper tool right here. So we can click that and then select an area in your image that should be white or a neutral color. And when you click that, it'll automatically adjust the temperature and tint so that what should be white in the image is white. You can also see that represented by the RGB values below. Um, this area is particularly too bright and too white, so auto white balance obviously as you can see is not gonna work. Another quick little tip is when you're hovering that eyedropper around your image, you can look at the preview panel on the left hand side and it'll show you what it'll look like and the effect it'll have if you click that area of the image to adjust your white balance using the eyedropper. Now we're gonna head down to the exposure panel. Here we have exposure, contrast, highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks. The exposure slider will either make your whole image brighter or darker. Below that we have the contrast slider, but I prefer to add in my contrast using the highlights and shadow sliders and or the tone curve as well. So I don't ever typically touch that slider. Now we'll adjust our highlights. And here's a quick tip for those. If you hold down the option key on Mac or the alt key on PC while you're adjusting the highlights, it will show you where in the image your highlights are blown out and where you've completely lost detail. Depending on what look you're going for in the photo, I typically will just adjust it until barely any blue spots or white spots remain. Additionally, you can turn on show clipping by pressing the J key which will then make all your overexposed or blown out areas in your image bright red so that you can see the areas where you need to bring down the highlights. So I'm just exaggerating that over here on the highlight slider, but if I go back to where it was, you can see that it looks pretty good. This will also show clipping in your shadows, but it'll highlight those areas as blue where you've underexposed too much and lost all shadow detail. I can show that by bringing down my shadows and you can see just under her foot right over here, there's a little blue area. The first option can be pretty useful if you have a lot of textures and colors in your image and can't really distinguish the blue or red because it completely blacks out the image and just shows the clipped highlights or shadows. So I've already adjusted my highlights, so I'm just gonna adjust the shadows here and bring those up for the purpose of this tutorial. I think that looks pretty good about there. Now we can see the ultimate effect this has had on the photo. The whites and black sliders, you can just adjust the taste. It basically just takes the brightest or darkest color values in your image and pushes them either towards or away from pure white or pure black. You can also use the option or alt trick when adjusting the whites or blacks to show where you've got pure white and where you've got pure black. Below this, we have the presence panel where we can adjust texture, clarity, dehaze, vibrance, and saturation. Texture, as the name suggests, either increases or decreases the appearance of texture in your photo. And let me just over exaggerate that for you right here so you can see everything gets way more defined and it looks just way too defined or it looks way too soft. 
and there's no texture. This can be useful for making skin imperfections and skin textures look softer and less defined. There are better ways to do that, but they involve a few more steps, so that's a topic for another video. Clarity basically just boosts the contrast in the details of the image without affecting the overall tone of the image. And this just over-exaggerates the effect that clarity can have on the image as well. It can be useful for making a photo look sharper or making it look softer and more dreamy without affecting the actual sharpness of the photo. Dehaze just basically boosts contrast in low contrast areas in an image if it features, you know, haze or if it just looks washed out. These tools are best used uh, very subtly just to add a little bit more pop to the image without actually making it look just fake and cartoony and overdone. So I might just add just a tiny bit of clarity in here, something like that. Finally, you might be wondering what vibrance and saturation do as they sound fairly similar. And they are. They both affect the saturation of the image, but vibrance targets the less saturated colors in the image, whereas saturation just boosts all the colors in the image. If I want to increase the color in my image, I'll typically just add a bit of vibrance. That way I don't risk blowing out all the more apparent colors in my image. So just from the adjustments I've made so far, you can see we've gone from this to this, which in my opinion looks way better. And it's important to remember that all these adjustments are subjective and it's gonna be what looks best to you. So below that panel, we have the elusive and mysterious tone curve. This tool can take some time to get accustomed to and learn how to use effectively in your photos. So I'm just gonna give a basic starting point and you can play around from there. So there's four tone curves, one specifically for boosting or decreasing the luminance of the shadows, midtones, and highlights in your image. And then there's three that independently affect the red, green and blue channels in your image as well. For the sake of this video not being 45 minutes long, we're just gonna cover the basics of the first panel. So on the tone curve here, we're going to make what's called an S curve. It's a very basic adjustment that just helps to make your image pop a bit more. And it's called that because when you add these three points here on your tone curve, you're going to bring down the shadows slightly, add a bit of contrast there, and then you're going to boost the highlights, which is just gonna give a bit more of a pop to your image. And as you can see, this is very subtle adjustment, but it looks sort of like an S. You can also lift the blacks in your image so that they give a very, there's no pure black and it gives a very faded look to the image. I might just do that just slightly. You can also lower the white so that there's no pure white either in your image. But I'm going to actually, I might just do that just slightly. Below the tone curve is the HSL panel or hue, saturation, and luminance. Here you can independently adjust all the colors in your image. So we've got red, orange, yellow, green, aqua, blue, purple, and magenta. And you can adjust the hue, saturation, and luminance of all those different colors. That way you can adjust them to your liking and suit whatever style you're going for for your photo. If you wanna make adjustments to a certain area of your photo, but you can't make out exact what color combinations will affect that area, Lightroom has a cool tool here where you can click this little dot symbol and then drag it into an area in your image and click that area and then drag up and down. And that'll adjust simultaneously the colors that make up that area. As you can see, the part of the sky I'm adjusting is made of aqua and blue. And you can just drag those to either change the hue, saturation, or luminance up or down. So I'm just gonna quickly make some edits here and I will show you what it looks like after I'm done. So as you can tell, it's relatively subtle, but here's the before and here's after. Before, after. Just subtle adjustments just to help make the photo pop a bit more. Below the HSL panel, we have the color grading wheels. And this is kind of where you can help create your look for the photo. Now, I kind of want to go based just representative of what I saw when I took the picture and it was a very warm light that day. So I'm going to try and bring some yellows in the highlights to represent that. So I just added in some yellow to the highlights and then just a bit of blue into the shadows. This is what it looked like before. And this is what it looks like now. Again, before and now. One other important change that I just want to show you quick is the lens correction tab down here where you can click enable profile correction. And if I dis disable that, you can see what it looked like before versus now once it's corrected. Before, now. We got a bit of vignetting in the corners and a bit of lens distortion. So it corrects it for your specific lens. You can go in and select that as well. 
and you can also click remove chromatic aberration. Just a very handy feature that Lightroom has to help make your shots look even better. Finally, the last feature I'm gonna go over today before we export the photo is the sharpening slider. So again, the Option and Alt key come into big effect here when you're choosing your masking option. If you click Option or Alt and move the masking slider, right now, the sharpening is affecting the entire photo, but you can also drag it down so that it masks out more specifically what you want the sharpening to apply to. So myself, ideally, I'm just gonna add in a bit of sharpening and be very more edge detail oriented rather than applying it to the whole image. And then you can adjust the radius while holding down Option and Alt and that'll just show how much of the edge details and stuff you're going to apply that sharpening to. And then just finish making your adjustments and boom, you're done. So now you're ready to export your photo and all you wanna do for that is go up to File in your toolbar and go down to Export. Make sure that photo is selected down here in the bottom and then choose where you want to export it to, what folder you want to export it to, where the location is, and you can choose to put it in a subfolder if you'd like. For me, I'm just going to send it to my desktop. And then you can choose the image format, what you want it to be exported as. I'm just going to choose JPEG. You can adjust the quality here, color space, and you can limit the file size within reason. I just pretty much will leave this as is, this as is. Output sharpening I'll typically turn off because we added sharpening in the image itself and I don't want to create any more noise by adding additional sharpening. And finally we just go down and click export and you'll see the little bar at the top here. It exported to the desktop really quick and now if we go out we've got it right here. And that's our final image without any sort of masking or anything like that. But this is just the basics to help you get started in your editing journey and just to show you what tools you have at your disposal. So let me come back in here and I will show you guys the before and after. And personally, I think that looks really nice and it's kind of what I envisioned for the shot. Obviously, I would go in and make a few more adjustments with masking and that kind of thing just to bring it that extra oomph to it. So that's it, that's the basics. Let me know if I missed anything, if there's anything you think I should have covered or you want me to cover. Um, let me know what was most helpful to you about the video. And if you enjoyed the video and got something out of it, I'm a small channel, so your subscribe, likes, and comments really mean a lot to me. So please do one or two of those three things, or all three. Um, it really helps me get my content out to more people and help me to create more videos like this for you guys. Now get out there and get editing. Till next time.